So, hello again. Uh, this then is the second feedback video for the Aberfan exam paper, looking now at source B. So, before we begin to actually look at the source itself, it's worth giving some consideration to the form of information which is provided in the box at the beginning. Um, of course, key here is the fact that it is the uh, report from a newspaper. So, whereas for uh, source A, we talked about how um, Laurie Lee's essay appears to have been written about a year after the event, which we said allows him that extra opportunity to um, to sort of reflect upon it and to sort of almost posthumously give order to those events by imposing on them that narrative framework that we identified. Um, this is going to be a much more immediate reaction to something that has happened. There's going to be much less opportunity for that kind of narrative structure to be imposed, and in fact we don't really see one. Um, what I think is significant with this text is the way that um, it begins, um, which I think, as I will go on to demonstrate, is very, very dramatically, very, very hyperbolically, but actually it goes on to be become almost pathetic in the way that it then um, actually presents this earthquake. Look at the first sentence. We have had an earthquake. Now, on the face of it, this is a simple sentence. It seems like a very mundane beginning, and yet actually I would argue that that very simplicity actually gives it a particular level of drama. It's a dramatic opening, and precisely because of its ambiguity, what it actually doesn't do is give us very much information. It therefore is a very effective hook into the text. Who is the we? What is the nature of this earthquake? How serious is it? These are the kind of ambiguous questions that it asks us. Now, given that the text goes on to talk about how minor the earthquake actually is, then you could actually argue that even the idea of the earthquake itself is ambiguous, since it implies that many people may not even have noticed. Let's look then how it continues. The men of science all tell us that we have every right to expect earthquakes. This country lies on the great volcanic belt. There runs under us a huge crack in the Earth's crust. Who knows how deep or how wide? A few flimsy strata have fallen in, and now who knows what enormous voids, what huge quantities of imprisoned gas, what seas of molten metal there may be only a few miles below this fair surface. Now, as I said, hyperbole really is the kind of dominant mood here, if you like, the dominant technique. Look at all these things, huge cracks. Obviously, the adjective huge, deep, wide, um, um, you know, huge, in fact, is repeated because you have a huge quantities too. The metaphor, the seas of molten metal. Now, on this basis, of course, you could be forgiven for expecting that this article is going to go on to talk about some sort of earth-shattering event that levels cities and you know, wipes out swathes of the population. But as we see, that is not um, the case. In the second paragraph, it continues, the scientists tell us there are probably many earthquakes which we do not feel. But if a small earthquake, even, imperceptible, even an imperceptible one, why not an earthquake to destroy a metropolis, uh, a great city? Um, so several people successfully paired the two um, rhetorical questions there, which do give this a sense of um, sort of mystery in the sense that there is this, it presents us with this fear of what could happen of a kind of worst case scenario. And yet actually, in a sense, the speculation that those two rhetorical questions engender is actually ultimately a fruitless one. Because, as this article demonstrates, while a dreadful earthquake may be possible, in actual fact, it didn't happen. It remains only speculation. <laughs>
Um, one other thing, which again a few people didn't mention successfully, the fact that this uh, article actually opens in the uh, sort of first person plural. We have had an earthquake. We, the men of science, tell us. Um, they runs under us. Um, so, in that sense, um, where Laurie Lee is distanced from the events in Aberfan by time, as well as by geographical location, and writes about this correspondingly in the third person that suggests, suggests that sense of, um, of distance um, and of um, his, his ability to write with some objectivity. Um, here, the writer is very much casting himself as one of the people. He is, as it were, a Londoner, fellows of, of these people. But on that basis, though, there is also a kind of an opposition then that begins to open up as a sort of a them and us. The juxtaposition between, on the one hand, us, we, the people, and the scientists referred to in the third person, the scientists, the men of science. Um, perhaps then is there a, a sense, um, is he, that he, is there a sense that he is taking this seriously, or alternatively, uh, is the point of this article, as some people sort of imply, almost mocking, almost satirical, um, is he mocking these scientists for their dramatic um, predictions when the reality is so much less exciting? That is one possible interpretation of this article. Now, rather similarly to the um, first text, the third paragraph here begins with this uh, sort of voltaic moment, with this but. Um, and this really marks the change between that initial um, bombast, that initial sort of portentous language, um, the hyperbole that uh, we described, and something much more pathetic. So he continues on, but the earth wave has been faint, and only a feeble echo of some distant shock, for it was not everywhere, nor was it every body that was waked by the earthquake of Tuesday, October 6th. First of all, then, we can contrast then now some of the language, the adjectives and so on that are used um, in juxtaposition to earlier on. Faint, for example, feeble. Um, the emphasis of that negation, not everywhere, nor was it everybody, um, to signify that um, actually this was indeed only a localised shock and not the great catastrophe that the opening of this article would have led us to believe. Um, it continues on then. More than half the nation has to accept the word of the rest, which emphasises what we've just said, the sense most people never even noticed, rely on other people to tell them. So, it goes on then. Yet many felt it that will never forget the feeling, and many even heard it that will carry the awful sound in the ear to their dying day. Now, this, I think, is where the sort of note of satire, the note of mockery, becomes more apparent. He says, for example, that, um, that it is awful, but note that the awful is placed in inverted commas. Um, in other words, it implies that there is a distance between the voice of he, the author, and the people who may have thought that. In other words, that it, it was not, in fact, awful at all and that people were, perhaps, some people perhaps overreacted. Quite a few people mentioned that adverb, it even did damage. Um, the implication being that actually in most places it did not at all. And then they talked about the, um, the again, linking to the idea of bathos, the idea of these very minor verbs that are used. It upset furniture, it broke crockery, um, uh, it displaced bricks, um, and my personal favourite is reveal the crack in a wall that presumably was already there um, before the earthquake anyway. So, um, so yes, there is this element of mockery then that the actual earthquake that many people um, were getting hysterical about was in fact not the case. In fact, you could argue, I suppose, that he's mocking both the scientists with their dramatic predictions 
and also the um, the many people who seem to have overreacted. So, to finally then, the last two sentences of this paragraph slightly muddy the waters. He says we should not be surprised to hear of more serious damage. Well, I'm not actually not. I suppose in a sense that there continues the mockery because more serious damage than this crack in the wall. So yes, I suppose it continues the tone of mockery. And then he finally finalises that paragraph, but if this much, why not more? Now, you could play that seriously. He's implying that another earthquake could come along and cause something more serious. But I think, again, we have to see it as tongue-in-cheek because he goes on to um, emphasise this idea of it as being very undramatic. If we look at the next line, he talks about um, Britannia's fabled rock has been shaken from its basis, be it only an inch or two. Um, so again, this paragraph, in it, or rather these two sentences, in a sense, form the, you know, a sort of microcosm for the structure of the whole article, because you have the initial um, hyperbole, followed by the bathos. Um, the inch or two obviously groups quite neatly back to the feeble and the faint quotations from the previous paragraph. Now, this opening here about Britannia's fabled rock, again, very serious. You're talking about the kind of mythological origins of Britain as a country, um, as particularly emphasised there by the use of the uh, adjective fabled, um, as in mythical, which I suppose groups quite neatly to the um, sort of mythological references that we identified in text A, in terms of the pyramids and in terms of the river Styx. But whereas in the case of the Laurie Lee extract, I think they were both used with absolute seriousness, here it's much more tongue-in-cheek, it's much more mocking. Um, Britannia's fabled rock, you know, this great warlike country, is shown to be getting itself into a state of panic on the basis of very little evidence, and that seems to be the point. Let's see then how it continues. Um, be it only an inch or two, the ocean throne has been tilted up. Throughout the Midland counties, the earthquake appears to have been felt the most. At Birmingham, walls were seen to move, and people rose from their beds to see what damage has been done. At Edgebaston, successive shocks were plainly felt, Houses were shaken to their foundations, a dreadful rattle was rather felt than heard, and people woke one another to ask of the meaning. Everything around was violently agitated. The houses cracked and groaned as if the timbers had been strained. The policemen on duty saw the walls vibrate, heard everything rattle about them, and were witnesses to the universal terror of the roused sleepers. Now, this seems to present it more seriously. And indeed, here we do see some more shocking descriptions. Um, things like uh, shocks plainly felt, houses shaken to the foundation, um, and so on. You know, violently agitated, um, houses that crack and groan. So there's lots of verb phrases there, lots of verbs that we can identify that do um, that do mention that. So on the one hand, this seems to present it more seriously, but as several of you picked out, the significant thing here is the placings. It mentions Birmingham, but then even more specifically than Birmingham, it mentions Edgbaston, which is one single district of Birmingham. So there's a sort of juxtaposition then between Britannia as a country, as an enormous country, and against one single small suburb area that actually seems to have felt any effects. So once again, although this seems to emphasise greater effects from the earthquake, actually, in reality, it's still playing it down. Um, it's still emphasising that any more serious effects that it may have had were only felt in a more localised way. Um, so, there we have it. If we're thinking briefly for a moment of this, about, again, further about the structure of this article, it's perhaps worth mentioning that it begins um, in a more universal context. Um, it talks about the country as a whole, um, even as far as the point where it talks about Britannia's fabled rock, before then it starts to zoom into the specific locations. Um, now in the next paragraph, what we then see 
is that he juxtaposes um, the uh, comparative severity of the events in Edgbaston with um, where the, the way that this was experienced in London. Um, which, of course, if we think that the likelihood is that this journalist is probably London-based, and of course, then as now, people felt very much of London as being, um, you know, the heart of the country. Um, you know, in a sense, then now, he's um, going to juxtapose the fact that actually these events were very peripheral. The seriousness of it at Edgbaston was very peripheral, very distant to the minor nature of it experienced in London. So he continues on. In London, we are situated on a deep bed of clay where our houses are well built and where we are so accustomed to noises, shocks and tremors that we are almost startled to find it calm and quiet. Noises from vast warehouses along the river banks bathed by the muddy and dull water of the great river while trains rush past at full speed or rumble underground, uttering horrible cries and vomiting waves of smoke. So, again, I suppose, if we're going to take the view that this article is critical of the views of those scientists and those who sought to hyperbolize um, events like this and the risk of events like this, then emphasising the sort of safety of London serves to do that. It suggests that actually it would be untouched. Um, and you can look at various things to describe that. It talks about the houses being well built, the location of the Great River. Um, so you've got that, the adjectival, adjectival phrase, well built. You've got the, the sort of metaphor of the Great River, which reflects on the Great City itself. Um, and you've got the emphasis on the power of industrial industrialization. Trains rush past at full speed, or rumble underground. In other words, I suppose what he's implying here then is that actually industrialization has given man the capacity to control nature, to take on nature. And therefore, when it talks in the second line of this paragraph about them being so accustomed to noises, shocks and tremors, the implication being that human industrial activity can produce effects that are just as dramatic as those which are, um, as those which the scientists fear. In other words, the scientists' fears are groundless because industrial progress has um, meant that the risk is not felt. Let's continue then. He goes on and he talks about London. And he mentions where men work in darkness, scarcely seeing their own hands and not knowing the meaning of their labour. London, a rainy, colossal city. Colossal city groups neatly back to the Great River, uh, Great River cluster I have mentioned. That, that smelling of molten metal and of soot, ceaselessly streaming and smoking in the night fog. A fog which persists and assumes different hues, sometimes ashen, sometimes black. With the lighting of fires, it soon becomes yellow and pungent, irritating the throat and eyes. Um, so this seems slightly more negative then, because it focuses more on the negative effects of industrialization, the pollution that that has caused, which actually links quite well, I suppose, in comparative terms back to the Aberfan extract. But whereas in the Aberfan extract, that is all used to sort of point structurally forward to foreshadow toward the dreadful ending there, here it's very different, because the grimness of this um, pollution seems to imply that this is as bad as it can get, that nothing that the world can throw at us, no minor earthquake, can rival the damage that's already happening. Um, perhaps that's the case, or indeed, if not perhaps the damage, and certainly the nature of, of humanity. Um, but yes, again, the emphasis of the fog and its impacts, irritating the throat and eyes, again, contrasts to the very minor damage that's described from this earthquake. He continues then, here, on this day, a large proportion of us felt a sh sort of shock and shiver, and the feeling of being upheaved, but very few of us 
could trust our own sensations and be sure it was something out of the usual course. And so at the end, he returns to the earlier presentation of this earthquake as actually having been a very minor event. Um, finally then, who can say what strange trial of shaking or upheaving, sinking, dividing or drying up may await us? We know by science these isles have gone through many a strange metamorphosis, and science cannot assure us that there are none more to come. So, I suppose in the end, it finalises this, um, this presentation of this earthquake by saying then that it is futile to try to predict what may happen. These scientists may hyperbolise um, the natural risks, but actually, as he demonstrates here, we're much more likely to observe the effects of industrialization, this rumbling underground from underground trains, for example. Um, so who knows then um, whether that will have just as much an impact. It's all about the fruitlessness of predicting the future. And so where this extract goes from that initial dramatic presentation and ends relatively pathetically, it also ends with a sense of uncertainty because it ends with this empty uh, speculation about what the future might hold. Um, so in every regard really there is a complete contrast to the first extract which as we said because of the much more narrative framework that it uses actually seems to um, or everything points towards the inevitability of that tragic disaster that happens. Um, here, um, ultimately, the message is that there has been no disaster, and no one can know if or when or what or even whether any disaster might actually take place. Um, so to conclude then, in terms of the text here, I think that we can certainly view this one as being comparatively satirical or perhaps comparatively mocking um, but that I think is really a point at the highest level and uh, if you didn't get that not to worry but it's always worth looking for whether that is, 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 is the case because you know really this article subverts that initial seriousness with which it initially presents it um, contrast that then to Laurie Lee uh, and the extreme seriousness uh, the way in which um, he's almost memorialising uh, the events leading up to and including uh, this landslide uh, natural disaster. Laurie Lee emphasises that in the end, although he talks about God, the, it's reasonably clear, I think, by implication, that he sees the hand of man in it. He sees it as being as a result of, for example, pollution that has caused... Um, uh, and, and man's abuse of the natural landscape that has caused this disaster. Um, whereas, uh, in this case, I suppose, um, he's rather downplaying it. You know, he's saying that uh, it's much, seems much less serious, um, and while it's possible that um, humanity may cause harm to the world, in actual reality, it, 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 he doesn't seem to see it um, as likely or possible. Um, so hopefully that covers some of the kind of general structure and perspective points that you might be able to make for question four. Um, in terms of the language points, obviously we've covered that. Um, and in terms of the content for question two, I think that's fairly self-explanatory.